the Lord. Yes. I hope that everybody's doing well. It's a little chilly, but it's warming up. So. Uh, I told someone at work today that Sunday, the forecast said it's going to be 40, so I said I'm pulling out the shorts. That's, that's summer weather for me right now. Anyway. Um, I did not have anything prepared for tonight because I wasn't on the schedule, but hey, the Lord will give me the word. I'm very excited for some things that are happening in my life. Uh, I wrote about this this morning on, on Facebook. You know, life is hard and you're going to have things thrown at you, but one thing that I have learned is to trust God, and he shows me the way. Amen. So I'm going to fall, I'm going to stumble, and it's happened, you know. My journey as a Christian hasn't been, hasn't been easy, but it has been very successful, I can say. Yeah. Um, rewarding should be And a few weeks ago, I posted the scripture online because every time that something good happens, this is the scripture that comes to mind. And it's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has, great, has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. You know, the Lord will make you a promise and sometimes you might think it relates specifically with something that's happening but it, that's not the truth necessarily so as we continue to pursue him and meditate on his word he will reveal to us the true meaning of that promise that was given to us at that particular time and every time that something good happens to me takes me back to the scripture. People say that I'm a very patient person, mm -hmm. and that's true, more now than before. Um, and I just stay the course, and it doesn't matter what is thrown at me. You know, life's gonna throw me lemons. I'm gonna make lemonade, mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna drink it. Uh, <laughs> or I might sell it for a profit, who knows? Whichever is more convenient. <laughs> but, you know, I just stay the course. And I know that whenever I fall, he's going to give me the strength to get up. Or he's going to extend his hand and pull me up mm -hmm. from my fall. So I encourage you to continue to look at him. He's laid out a path in front of you for us to walk for the things that he has promised that he has revealed to us through dreams or uh, messages spoken by other people or just revelation from reading his word, all those things are gonna come to pass as long as we stay on that path. Amen. So I encourage you to, to continue to pursue him and believe him and have that endurance because what he promised you, you're gonna have. or testimonies, questions, comments? Mike. Please be here. Hey. <laughs> Good deal. Uh, yes, Sally. Continue to pray for Suzanne and sister all the time. She's kind of been a little bit ill. So we'll pray we'll for pray. Sarah Lynn. Uh, who else? Sarah Lynn.
and she goes, reading from uh, John 17 that it talks about the oneness um, it says in verse 11 and I am no longer in the world but they are in the world and I am coming to you Holy Father keep them in your name which you have given me that they may be one even as we are one you know Jesus prayed This was for, for his uh, apostles, but this is a prayer for, for all of us because yeah. we are his children. And he is saying yeah. here that God will, will keep us to his name so that we become one in him. Right. Yeah. So pray for one with him. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Let's go to the Lord tonight. Father, we thank you for bringing us together in your presence tonight. We thank you, Lord, because we're two or three are gathered in your name. There you are. And we know, Lord, that you are in this place right now, and your glory will be manifested. We come to you boldly, Lord, with all of these requests, knowing that all the promises that you have given Abraham are ours to have here on this earth.
Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Have you heard from Tammy? Okay. <coughs> Lift up Tammy and Erica. Mm -hmm. Peter. And we already lifted up Suzanne. And also the other soprano who hasn't joined us yet, who will be joining us soon. Hallelujah. Your face outshines the brightest sun. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. With eyes that blaze like burning fire. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. King of glory, have your glory. King of glory, have your glory. Yes, Lord, your face out and shines the brightest sun. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. With eyes that blaze like burning fire. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. King of glory, have your Lord, you are so worthy, Lord. Your voice like a rushing water sound, like a river. You are so powerful. You are so powerful. And in your hands you hold the stars. Jesus, you're powerful. You are so powerful, King of glory, have your glory, King of glory, have your glory, King of glory, King of glory, have your glory. Have your glory in this place, some more of you, Lord. More of you, Lord, and more and more and more. Because your voice is rushing. What a sound. Jesus, you're powerful. Yes, Lord. You are so powerful. And in your hand you hold the stars. Yes, Lord, in Jesus, you're powerful. You are so powerful. King of glory, have your glory. King of glory, have your glory. Hallelujah, Lord. Have your way in the 
this place, Lord, this night, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord.
once again, Lord, you breathe on us again. Let the wells of the kingdom that's within us burst your glory in this place. Burst your glory in this place. Let your will. Let your love flow like a mighty river from our spirit from you, Lord. Let the fire that burns within us, Lord, burn it light, burn your light.
17. We're going to read verses 1 through 11, and then we'll just go back and, go, and pretty much stay in, uh, in John 17, although I will jump in a little bit, but that's going to be the focus anyway. So John 17, beginning at verse 1, and we'll read right through to verse 11. Jesus is preparing uh, to go to the cross. So if you can, Mike, go back to verse 4. This is, uh, you know, in the upper room, the last uh, conversation really that he has before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So he completed the work that he was given, right? And then he describes that work. What's shocking to me is that when Jesus summarizes his work on earth, he doesn't start reliving all the great sermons that he preached and all the people and all the crowds that came to hear him. He doesn't uh, talk about the amazing miracles that he performed, giving sight to the blind, seeing the lame walk, causing uh, multitudes to be fed with very little. He doesn't even mention bringing the dead back. Instead, he talks repeatedly about this small group of men that God had given him out of the world. They were the work that God had given him. Praise the Lord. I'm going to go back and just touch on a few of these uh, briefly here, but verse 6. those whom you gave me out of the world. All right, verse 10. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. For all I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. Praise the Lord. Verse 12. So while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name that you gave me. All right, verse 13. This is really more about aggravating Mike than it is about anything else. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Verse 19.
For them I sanctified myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus' prayer in the upper room, he went to the cross and he died. Praise the Lord. All right, go to John chapter 17, verse 18 now, Mike. I think the battery's about to go dead. Here. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Verse 22. How are we doing now? Any better? So the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. <laughs> Am I vibrating? Christian, any believer can do this. You don't need mega skill. You don't need uh, unusual abilities. You don't need to be the miracle man to make disciples. You don't need to be a big time pastor or a charismatic leader to make disciples. You don't need to be a great communicator. Praise the Lord. You don't need to be an innovative thinker to make disciples. That's why Jesus says every Christian can do this. One of the unintended results of most church, the strategies that we come up with, that churches come up with, that revolve around performances, places, programs, professionals, is that somewhere along the way, people get left out of the picture. Right. And it becomes about the individuals. It becomes about whoever's doing the speaking, wherever it is he's doing the speaking, and so on. The sad truth to that is when, according to Jesus, people are God's method of winning the world to himself. Not atmospheres, not big names, not, you know, great uh, talents. He takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Amen? People who, he, he wants to use people that are not sidelined to a chair on Sunday and Wednesday while they watch professionals do ministry. But people who are equipped on Sunday and Wednesday to participate in ministry every day of the week. That's why we do what we do here before the services. Amen. I know it, it's odd to some people. They, they find it kind of unusual, but it's to help people to feel confident in expressing themselves to other people about what God is doing in their life, about what they're hoping God will do, what they're wanting God to do, or what God has done. That's what ministry really is. It's just sharing Jesus with somebody else, your experience, what he does for you, what he's meant to you. Amen? So how do we do it? If making disciples is the plan of Jesus... And if it's accessible for all of us or to all of us and it's expected of all of us, then how do we do it? Well, I think maybe we just lack a clear understanding about what it means to make disciples. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Verse 17. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. 
Now, this isn't about your good works glorifying God. It may sound like it, but it's not. Because it's the people who glorify God. But it's lost people. That'll make you back up and think for a minute. It's lost people that are looking at you. They're the light. Or they are the they, I should say. Amen. Who we are to deal with. They're the they that he's talking about in this verse. Let your light shine, Jesus said. Right? What light? John 17, 22 and 23. Thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. This is exactly what Jody was talking about, and it's also what Roberto was talking about Sunday, and again uh, briefly this evening. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Praise the Lord. Jesus brought that glory with him. When he moved inside of you, he didn't leave it behind. He, it's not something that comes at some other point in, in your life or in your relationship with God. It came when he came. Amen. So it's grace thinking, grace believing, and grace instincts that will light up you to other people that are lost. And that glorifies God. It's always been his grace that glorifies him. Praise the Lord. Today's church has to recapture this simple understanding this wonder that has been taught throughout the scripture everywhere you go in the scripture is there the glory of God is his grace praise the Lord amen every day the voice of grace cries out to you amen so that it may cry out through you amen so that people can see God's glory in you the grace of God they need to, they need to understand the grace of God not a bunch of religious uh, rituals or duties, but God's goodness, God's mercy, God's grace. And he, you have that ability innately because you have God in you. You have Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? All you got to do is let it shine. Praise the Lord. Share that reality. That's what he's talking about when he says, let your light so shine to men. Let people see the goodness of God. Let people see the glory of God in you. You say, well, that, what's, there's nothing to that. Well, yeah, Try that with a co-worker who's a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Try that with a, you know, somebody who is just unlovable. Who is atheistic and hateful and everything else. All you have to do is reflect the reality of God's grace, God's goodness, God's favor. You don't need to fix them. Right. Praise the Lord. You just need to reveal God to them. Romans 8, verse 32. And this is something we can do and do constantly. I mean, you're in, you're in contact with people all the time, whether you like it or not. I love that commercial uh, for uh, rental cars. The guy says, you know, I don't have to talk to any human if I don't want to. And there's two of them standing there. He says, and I don't. <laughs> and that's the way a lot of us feel a lot of the time. We're just... He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Praise the Lord. All right, Romans 8, verses 19. And, uh, well, 19, and we'll just skip that for the moment. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, we've talked about this a lot in a lot of different contexts, but this, I believe, is the context in which it was meant to be talked about. Amen. The creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Amen. The unbelievers are not children of God. They're just part of the creation. They're just creatures. Praise God. So the creature is waiting. The, the lost, the unbeliever, is also wants to, needs to be delivered from the bondage of corruption, which all of us came from. Amen into the glorious liberty of the children of God. But somebody's got to let that glory shine. Amen. Verse 21. That is verse 21. Praise the Lord. 
Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Have you got that yet? Because we can't go back and read it again if you need to. Praise the Lord. Grace will be glorious. Hallelujah. Yeah. It's the theme of the disciples, of the saints, and the angels, and it will be for all of eternity. Yeah. So it ought to be now. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So it must become, therefore, the great theme of the church. If it's the theme of eternity, which we've read, then it ought to be our theme. It ought to be what we are focused on, right? Yeah. Praise the Lord. When grace fills our hearts, God's glory fills our world. And he said, before this is all wrapped up, his glory will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Somebody is going to have to start revealing this. Somebody is going to have to start doing this grace revelation thing in order for this world to see the glory of God. And they're, we know they're going to. It's just a question of who's going to do it. Praise the Lord. Until you understand that, you don't understand your mission on earth. You don't understand why you're still here. Praise the Lord. The unspeakable riches of grace. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So what Paul's saying is, the influence that he had was not because of his great speaking, not even because of all the miraculous that took place around him, but because of the grace of God that was in him. That's what drew people. That's what drew people to Jesus. You never see, you know, he's never, he's never harsh with the sinners, with the unbeliever. It's only the religious elite that he has issues with. Praise God. Don't fix. Don't fuss. God really looks at them. For God so loved the world. He didn't ask our opinion about this. Praise God. And I'm so glad he didn't. Because when Paul talks about all of these nasty things, he said, and such were some of you. Such was I. And such were all of us, to some degree or another. And so are all of them. The only thing we did to be a child of God was to believe in the goodness of God. And that's all they had. Instead of us giving them things to do to get their act together, just give them Jesus. Just give them the truth about the goodness of God, the love of God. You know, I hear it in every service, in, in the testimonies that we're talking about, even when we talk about, uh, in, in the case of Tim, dealing with students, with others, with co-workers, and so on and so forth. That's what you're doing. Whether you, you know, have a theological understanding of that or not isn't what's important. What's important is you're revealing the goodness of God, the grace of God, the love of God. Because as a Christian, you can't be separated from that Christianity. In other words, if a person knows that you're a Christian, they're judging Christianity based on the way you treat them, or the way you talk to them, the way you act towards them. Therefore, they assume that that's how God looks. Amen? Just like Jesus. We know Jesus, grace is that person. Grace is the person of Jesus. It's not a thing. It's a reality. It's a person. Grace and truth came with Jesus. Amen? Well, just the same way that Jesus accepted you, just as you are, just as you were, just as you still may be, just as you might be next month or next year or ten years from now, he accepted you. He accepts you. You are accepted in the beloved. Even with all of our faults, even with all our failings, even with all of our sin, we're accepted. Because he was rejected. My God, my God, why hast thou rejected me? So that I could be accepted. He did no wrong. I did no right. I got his reward for his total obedience to God. And he got the judgment I got for my total rebellion against God. It's true for everybody. I mean, it's true for the murderer, the drug
I got. The wife beater. The child abuser. I mean, this is not easy. It's not easy to say that. Because innately, as humans, we believe they don't deserve the love of God. They deserve punishment, and most likely they'll get punished by our culture, you know, by our laws. But there's forgiveness for everybody in Jesus. And probably the only way that they escape their demonic condition is to trust in that love, to trust in that forgiveness. Praise the Lord. I'm not saying there aren't consequences. I'm saying the consequences don't come from God. Anybody that goes to hell doesn't go to hell because God sends them there. They go to hell because they reject the only avenue of escape, which is Jesus. Hell wasn't created for people, but people will go there because they side with the enemy who will go there and will be bound there for eternity. Praise the Lord. When you're dealing with other people, be okay with God's pace for them. Amen? I mean, we're not the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit, but it's not for us to correct, to fix. It's for us to reveal and let the Holy Spirit deal with them. Praise God. I mean, it's not our responsibility to make everybody perfect. It's our responsibility to make Jesus accessible to everybody, perfect or not. Praise the Lord. Whenever you go, wherever you go, whatever path God leads you, Whomever leads you to, be found resting in the grace of God, who delights in you, who wants to be revealed in you. With our whole selves, the redeemed of the Lord will glorify him. The creation itself will join in and glorify God. When? children of God are manifest. The only difference between a child of God and the unbeliever is Jesus. The only way they can ever come to a, a revelation of Jesus is the same way they can only come to a revelation of God through Jesus. And that's what he's talking about in John 17. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. I don't do anything except what my Father tells me. All that I do is in response to what the Father said. He didn't come here to give us Christianity. Praise the Lord. He came here to set us free. To make us the human beings. I don't want to get ahead of myself and preach a Sunday's message. But he came to make us the human beings that we were created to be in the first place. Jesus was a man. He was God. He was fully God, but he operated fully as a human being here on the earth. And it shows us how you win souls, how you let your light shine. It's not your light. It's the glory of God that's in you that reveals the reality of God to other people. All we need to do is be honest about it. All we need to do is share how good God is them experience that same glory. Let them see the reality of God. You know, it's it's not surprising that uh, it's usually other religious people that struggle with these things. Because the unbelievers, if you look at it in the Bible, these people, these sinners were attracted to Jesus because he was always affirming always uh, being positive with them, always sharing, not that God said this, God said that, but he's just showing, revealing in his own life how good God is and how God looks at people. Now, he, does, does that mean that he didn't love the religious people? Of course not. But he's trying to, sh he's trying to show the difference between what we think God wants and what God really wants. 
God wants us. We are his priority. Every human being is a priority to God. And the only thing we have to do is let that glory shine out, be revealed. Let that be the grace is his glory. Let that grace show grace. It's not just that I need grace. Everybody's got to have grace. Everybody needs grace or he wouldn't have come. Amen. So I'm not saying this is the way you do it, but I'm saying typically and historically, this is the way the church has dealt with people. Get your check off list and, you know, quit the smoking, stop drinking, stop cussing, go to church, you know, do this, do that, don't do this. And we've got the cart in front of the horse. Without the relationship with Jesus, you can, how, why would we expect them to do anything other than what they do? I mean, right? They're sinners. Jesus wasn't shocked that people were drinking and getting drunk and partying and, and uh, stealing and cheating one another and lying and, and, and being prostitutes and all the other things that he dealt with all the time. You don't see him you know, making big deals out of you. Don't do that again. Don't do that. The woman caught in adultery. But what he does is share the love that God has for them as a human being. How will they ever have respect for themselves if they don't have any respect for God? How can they love themselves or love anybody else without loving themselves? And how can they love themselves if they think God hates them? The first step towards reconciliation is God's acceptance. Somebody's got to tell him he accepts you just as you are. I mean, I love that. We used to say that. People say, come, you know, now it's time for the altar call. Just as you are, just and they hardly get to help me Jesus out of their mouth before we're slipping them the, you know, the card to sign to join the local church and here's what you can't do anymore and here's what you need to do in order to be a part of our group. And I had a young lady uh, last week said that she found a card back there where we have people trying to sign up, just sign the card so we can contact them if they need prayer or whatever. We've never, you know, bugged people or harassed them or anything else. But she wanted to fill it out because she wanted to join the church. I said, oh, you, are you a believer, aren't you? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, you're already in the church. <laughs> what are we going to do? But what are we going to do that Jesus hasn't already done, right? Yeah. Now, I understand people have, you know, want a local church membership or what have you, but we just don't do that because anybody that comes here as a believer is a member. Right. Praise the Lord. And yeah. as a member, you have the choice to go wherever you want to go or to be with whatever body or group you want to be with. So... We're not trying to manipulate or, or, or you know, I've, I've been down that road for years where even within denominations, people would fight over which church they went to. Yeah. You're two blocks away from another church of the same denomination, but they're telling you that the people over in that church, <laughs> well, I'm not sure that they're really got it all together because <laughs> you're the one you want to take a shot, go ahead, but I wouldn't risk it. Yeah, I mean, we, we when we were uh, in the Holiness Church, Pentecostal Church, actually it got, the, it got so bad that it was, uh, and this is not, I mean, these people are just people, but I'm just saying, this is the mindset that gets into unbelief when they hear the kind of things that go on. And we had, you know, Holiness Church, and women don't cut their hair. And uh, so... Five churches, five of the same denomination. A couple of them were independent, but they had the same doctrinal stance in this one in the town that we lived in, the community that we lived in, which was wow, well, like twenty-five thousand people or something. But five. That was just these Pentecostal churches. Now there were Baptist churches, Catholic churches, Methodist churches, all the other churches too. On top of that, but I'm just talking about these. And they said they would tell it to tell you that uh, well, you know can't go down there because they celebrate Christmas or they put up a Christmas tree or you can't go over there because the women uh, you no know, they don't cut their hair but they don't wear their hair up and of course you know that's wearing your hair down is kind of provocative <laughs> I was never provoked by it but I mean hey, they were in charge so but I'm just saying that's the kind of stuff that happens in religion 
We're not pointing people to Jesus. We're not focused on Jesus. We're focused on us. What we do and what we don't do to please God. Listen, God is well pleased with you. Right? Why? Because of Jesus. He has made you accepted. He, you can say the same thing about yourself that, that God said about Jesus. This is my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. Because he is what God sees you to be. He sees you. He loves you. But he sees you as though you were as perfect as Jesus because of the sacrifice Jesus made for you. And that's what the world needs to know. That is the glory of God. It's his grace that they need to understand. And sadly, uh, I lived for 40-some years, and a number of those years in the church, without ever knowing that. I still thought it had a lot to do with me. If I was getting all my T's crossed and I's dotted. And I knew I wasn't, so I just figured I'd fake it till I did. Try to, but you don't want to you don't want to be ostracized by the church because you're not perfect. Well, thank God, you can tell anybody. Bring your imperfect self here. You'll fit right in. It's like the old joke, you know, about, I don't want to go to that church. It's a bunch of hypocrites. Well, come on, one more won't hurt. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we're, all, we're all trying to be better than we are. Hallelujah. But none of us can be as good as we are. We've been declared righteous, perfect, holy, accepted. And that's what the world needs to hear. It sounds counterintuitive, I know, because we want to fix them. Let God fix them. You just reveal Jesus and let him do what he does. He's the only one that can do it anyhow. And wherever they are in their walk with God, that's between them and God. Let God deal with them. If they understand God to be this loving God that he is, this God of grace that he is, they'll be receptive. They'll be open. They'll be moldable and, my, and, and pliable in the hands of the potter. Yeah. Praise the Lord. It's only when we get in there and start messing with the clay that we screw everything up. Praise the Lord. So let's, let's show them this oneness that we have with Jesus and oneness with God. Because in the end, this is how it all wraps up. It's how it all ends up. Everything comes back to God. Everything ends up in God. Everything is held together. Everything exists. Everything was created by and exists because of Jesus and for Jesus. Praise the Lord. Let's keep it simple. Just love people. Just forgive people. Just show grace to people and let them see what real Christianity is all about. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. And praise God. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. Thank you for your patience for my rambling. And, uh, you know, I, it's all about, I'm just so excited about Cindy being back that I couldn't keep a train of thought tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless all of you. Remember how much God loves you and be willing to share that with everybody else. And that will make everybody happy. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless you. See you back here Sunday. Stay safe and warm.